welcome to today's video. Today, I want to help you understand why gut healing feels so complicated. Now I've broken the gut down into three layers so that we can take a look at each layer in a little bit more detail. The first layer, and this is where you're probably thinking when we're talking about gut health. This is the obvious function of the digestive system being digestion. If you have problems at this level, correcting them alone can still be complex. Even though this is the simplest level that I'm going to elaborate on today, the digestive system is still very complex at this level. Personally, I don't really understand why the way the digestive system works isn't explained more simply in, let's say, education in schools, but also for medical professionals, because if you can actually understand the important parts of the physiological process of how digestion works, it can lead you to some very interesting conclusions about how we support the digestive system at this level, how many of the things that we actually do currently with the way that we live on this world and with what mainstream medicine would suggest for you to do about these symptoms makes very little sense and how it's completely misaligned with understanding how the digestive system actually functions. I'm gonna do this for you now. I'm gonna walk you through as simply and as quickly as I'm able, how the digestive system actually works and where the most common dysfunctions present themselves. When you look at the digestive system like this, it's a very solutions oriented lens. I love looking at things through a solutions oriented lens because generally the solutions mean your symptoms are going to be going away which is probably exactly what you want. So I look at the digestive system through the lens of the five pillars. The reason that I do this is that these pillars are indivisible functions of the digestive system. These are very clear and distinct functions. And if one of these functions doesn't work, it doesn't matter how well all of the other functions are working, you will have digestive problems. And although the digestive system is complex, by refining how we're looking at the digestive system into these five pillars allows us to account for upwards of about 95% of symptoms and dysfunction. So the first of the five pillars, and we're going to work chronologically through the digestive system, as in if you were to eat a meal, which comes first? So the first of these five pillars is the stomach acid. The function of stomach acid is threefold. First, we want to try to kill as many pathogens as we can. Anytime you have food poisoning, there's a really good likelihood that the meal that you ate, you didn't have enough stomach acid. This is one reason that big cats like tigers and lions and things can eat literally rotting carcasses and not get sick because their stomach acid levels are so potent, they are so strong that they can kill all of the microbes. And we should actually have stomach acid levels that have a similar potency to that of big cats. So that's our first line of protection. It also liquefies all of our food. Before anything leaves the stomach, it should be completely liquid. I know that might seem a bit weird, you know, when you eat like nuts and seeds and these big chunks of meat that you definitely don't chew enough. But I mean, look at a tiger. Does a tiger chew? It just literally bites it off and swallows it. It's really important for whatever we eat to be completely liquefied because when we liquefy it, it increases the surface area, which allows all of the other digestive machinery to come to work on it. And the third thing is that some of the enzymes that we use for digestion are pH dependent, which means they only work within a certain pH range. Our acid levels need to get strong enough. They need to become acidic enough so that they can enable an enzyme to work. This enzyme is called pepsin. This is why if you've ever taken betaine HCL, which is like a physiological preparation of stomach acid, it almost always comes with pepsin because the acid has these other functions, but one of the primary functions is we're trying to enable the function of the pepsin enzyme, which needs to be in an extremely acidic environment. This is how we digest protein. So if you have any problems with digesting protein, this is the core physiological function that your body uses to break down proteins. So if you have any aversion to meat or animal products, there's a really good likelihood that there's something wrong at the stomach acid level. If you have any problems in the stomach as well, so this is like H. pylori, this is gastritis, this is reflux, there's a really good likelihood you have a problem with your acid levels. Today I'm really trying to bring you awareness of how this works, so I'm not going to go through 
the solution to each of these problems because otherwise we're going to have another two hour long video on our hands. But I do have a gut health course inside our gut health bundle called the five pillars to hear your gut where we literally go over exactly this. I'm going to continue to elaborate on each one. If you're interested in the solutions to these things, definitely go and check that out. So just to summarize, the biggest indicator is that you have a problem with your stomach acid, not digesting animal products or an aversion to animal products. This can be very connected to mineral deficiencies. So if you have anemia from an iron-based anemia or a B12-based anemia, that could be an acid thing. If you have osteoporosis, that could be an acid thing. If you have nutritional deficiencies of different minerals, that can be connected to your stomach acid levels. If you have GERD or reflux, there's almost always an acid problem. And it's not always that there's too much, it's very often that there's not enough. If you have gastritis, there's an acid problem. If you have gastroparesis, there is an acid problem. And this is the first pillar, stomach acid. The second pillar is digestive enzymes. So what is supposed to happen is this liquid in your stomach, at this point it's called chyme, it gets so acidic, it becomes completely liquid, and this very strong acid level will trigger the stomach to begin to release some of the contents into the small intestine. The stomach has a really strong mucosa, so it's designed to handle all of this very strong acid. The small intestine is not designed for this. So what happens is we have this solution that is released into the small intestine at the same time that the stomach empties. And this contains digestive enzymes, bile, and sodium bicarbonate, which is a very alkaline substance, which allows us to neutralize this acid so we don't damage the small intestine. But it also changes the pH, which means that different enzymes will begin to be activated. So when we're talking about digestive enzymes here, we're primarily talking about the enzymes that are produced by the pancreas. So the ones that are most specifically worth noting at this stage are amylase, lipase, and different proteases. So these proteases sort of complement what pepsin has already been doing in the stomach. They support the digestion of proteins. Amylase is the first step in starch digestion. So starch are these foods like potatoes, rice, pasta, bread. They're basically very long chains of sugar that are stuck together. And amylase will begin to cleave these long chains and turn them into smaller chains known as disaccharides. They're basically, so disaccharide means two sugar. So it's two sugar molecules bound together. So we're going from this massive chain into this disaccharide sugar. So this isn't fully digested yet. We're going to revisit this final part of the starch digestion process in just a moment. But this is the first step and it is very important. And finally, we have lipase. Lipase is what we use to digest fats. The thing is, fats are hydrophobic. They don't mix with water very well. So before the lipase can actually do any work, we need to emulsify these fats. And that's where the bile comes in, but we'll come to that in a moment. The most common indicators that you're struggling with a digestive enzyme deficiency. First of all, if you do functional testing, you'll see that you have low pancreatic elastase. That's one thing to look for. I very frequently see that people who have low digestive enzymes are dealing with problems like constipation is a very common one and also generally having problems with energy in their body. So this could look like chronic fatigue or just always feeling tired and never having enough energy. The reason for this is enzymes are catalysts, which means they speed up how quickly reactions are happening. And the place that we have the most enzymes is our digestive system. But we use enzymes in a whole bunch of other processes all over our body, in our kidneys, in our liver, all over the place. And if you don't have enough digestive enzymes, your body's probably struggling to produce enough enzymes in those other areas as well. But by supporting the digestive enzymes, we also support the production of all of those other enzymes because the body can then reprioritize all of the energy that it was putting into digestive enzyme production and put it into producing those other enzymes instead. Also, if your stools are emulsified, so they're not oily, they're not visibly oily, but they float, that can be an indicator that you're not producing enough lipase. And if you tend to get a lot of bloating, gas, discomfort, indigestion. Those can be really good indicators that you don't have enough digestive enzymes. And if you think about it, it makes sense. The digestive enzymes are supposed to help us break down our food quickly so that we can digest it and absorb it. If we can't do that, microbes are gonna feast on it and they're gonna produce gas and a whole bunch of other substances. Maybe helpful, probably harmful. So it's really important that we're actually digesting the food that we eat. Moving on to the third pillar, we have bile. Bile also has more than just its digestive function is a very important part of our detoxification system and is one of the ways that the body protects itself from dysbiosis in the small intestine. So things like SIBO and CIFO. The digestive function is that it emulsifies fats for us. So it makes fats dissolve in water. Therefore, 
lipase is able to begin to work on it so we can break down fats so that we can digest them and absorb them. Bile also behaves like soap. So just as you would use soap to clean dishes that have got lots of grease on, and that's kind of what it's doing in your gut, it's helping you to digest the fats. We also use soap to clean our hands to protect us from bacteria and viruses and things like that. The same thing happens in your gut. Your body uses bile like soap to clean itself. So if the bile isn't healthy and it isn't flowing very well, you're going to have things growing in the intestines that you don't really want there. And finally, this is my favorite function of bile because it is so underrated and enormously important. The bile is how the body removes all fat soluble toxins. So all these nasty things that you hear about, mold and mycotoxins, heavy metals, plastics, all these different food chemicals, petroleum byproducts, all of these different things. The most toxic substances tend to be fat soluble substances and the way that the body removes them is it brings them to the liver. The liver does a whole bunch of different work, a bunch of different processes and then it packages them up and puts them in the bile so that they can be moved into the digestive system and excreted in the stool. If your bile isn't healthy, if your bile secretions aren't working well, you cannot detox. This is something that I am literally trying to scream from the rooftops because I see people like doing cleanses and doing all these different like detox modalities and doing the sauna and, and these things are all great, but if your bile isn't flowing properly, you can not detox. The biggest indicator is that your bile isn't healthy. First of all, obviously, intolerance to fats. If you find that fats cause digestive problems, if they make you feel bloated or uncomfortable, if when you go to the toilet, you are either getting floating stools or you're seeing an oil film, that's a good indicator that your bile isn't healthy. If you have any pain in the liver gallbladder area, this is probably a problem for you. If you have a history of gallstones or if you have your gallbladder removed, you have a bile problem some of the non-digestive indicators that you have a problem with your bile. If you have any genetic mutations like MTHFR, there's a good likelihood that influences the health of your bile. If you're dealing with chronic autoimmune problems that are caused by toxicity, or if you have chronic digestive problems like SIBO, SIFO, you probably have a bile problem. If no matter how many detoxes you do, you do all of these different detox modalities, they just never seem to work you probably have a bile problem. The bile and the liver are also very connected to the skin. So if you have like greasy skin or you have skin problems like acne or rosacea, they can be really connected again to your bile health. So these are all really key indicators. The fourth pillar is motility. So after we've had all of these secretions in the upper part of the small intestine, the bile, the digestive enzymes have been secreted after the acid has done all of its work. We're then left with the motility, which is the body's ability to contract the intestines to move the food through a movement known as peristalsis. So peristalsis is actually this very finely coordinated process. It's not just as simple as put food in and then your intestines wriggle until it comes out. It actually moves the food back and forth. It's not just a one-way process so that you get a maximum exposure over the mucosal membranes in your gut so that you can absorb as much of the food and as much of the nutrients as possible. This also allows the brush border enzymes to do more work, but we're gonna to come to those in just a moment. The obvious indicators that you have a problem with motility would be chronic constipation or chronic diarrhea. Because if you think about it, they're basically the maximum ends of the spectrum of what could happen if motility isn't at that perfect balance right in the middle. If it's too fast, you've got diarrhea. If it's too slow, you've got constipation. I find that motility is the most challenging of the pillars to treat with physiological interventions. I find this is really connected to the nervous system, but again, we'll come to that in a moment. And we have the final pillar, which is the mucosa. The mucosa is extremely important. It's basically the pillar that is connected to the leaky gut phenomenon. If your mucosa is weak, molecules that should stay in your digestive system, that should never enter the bloodstream, enter the bloodstream. And when this happens, all of hell just breaks loose. You can develop autoimmune problems. You completely overwork your immune system. It prevents you from digesting your food correctly. It is just this absolute roller coaster to hell. It is a nightmare. So that first function is that it keeps the undigested food and whatever is in your gut that's supposed to stay in your gut, in your gut. If it doesn't have a strong integrity, it doesn't keep it where it's supposed to be. And that causes massive problems. The second function is that it is covered in brush border enzymes. So these are enzymes that are present on the surface of the mucosa. These are used to digest a whole bunch of different substances. They're used to break down these disaccharide sugars into monosaccharide sugars. So this includes the starch molecule that I described earlier, but this is also all of the other disaccharide sugars. This is your table sugar. 
This is the sugar in coconut sugar, in maple syrup. This is lactose. This is all of the disaccharide sugars. They're digested by your brush border. So if your brush border is damaged, you're going to lose the ability to digest all of these sugars. And this is why many people with gut problems tend to go carnivore or keto or avoid carbohydrates because the gut lining is damaged. This is also where we produce many other things like, for example, DAO, diamine oxidase. This is something that helps us break down histamine. So again, if the gut's damaged, you're producing less DAO. So mucosa are extremely important. Generally good indicators that you have mucosal damage would be intolerance to these sugars, as I mentioned. If you've got any kind of autoimmune disease, literally any autoimmune disease at all, this can be some kind of autoimmune arthritis, this can be Hashimoto's, it doesn't matter what it is. If you have an autoimmune disease, it's almost certain that you have leaky gut and you have a damaged mucosa. There's also a pretty good likelihood that you have a damaged mucosa if you have any abdominal pain and also if you have or experience a wide variety of food sensitivities. So you know that if that is you because you're already on a very restricted diet, you know, maybe you've got between five and 25 safe foods. If that's you, you probably have damage on your mucosa. Well, there's your really quick masterclass. I've actually done this several times before. We call it the Leaky Gut Masterclass, where we walk you through the five pillars and help you understand how the digestive system actually works. Because if you really begin to understand how it actually works, you can fix it. You can support it so that it can heal itself. If you want to go into this in more detail, be sure to check out that course. I'll leave a link for it below. That concludes the first level. So this is the actual digestive function. Maybe having listened to that, you're thinking, wow, that actually answers many of my questions and gives me lots of new things to try. But I'm sure potentially you could also be on the other side where you're like, yeah, I know all of that already. And I still have complex digestive problems and I still don't know what to do. Well, don't worry. We've only just finished step one of three. So you've got two more steps to go because this really is a rabbit hole. It's like, I learned this personally. I did all of the things that I've just described. I worked through all of these five pillars. The reason I discovered them is I had chronic digestive problems and I really wanted to figure it out. So I just did everything that I could to try to make sense of it. And, and this is what I found. But the rabbit hole goes deeper and we're going to that next level. So at this next level, you have to think about the other functions of the digestive system. So you don't just digest food in your digestive system. It's actually probably the site in your body where you have the most biological activity in your whole body. So your liver is also a very bioactive site in your body. Technically, your liver is kind of a part of your digestive system, but even if it wasn't, just the small intestine and large intestine alone, you have more biological activity in this area than in the whole rest of your body combined. You know, we have 10 times more microbial cells than human cells in our whole body, and the majority of them are in the gut. Your gut is such a bioactive organ, there is so much activity going on here. And yes, potentially a good portion of it is digestion, but we need to look at what these other functions are so that we can begin to understand where the other dysfunction can be occurring in the digestive system. Now, there are a lot of things, but the thing I really want to focus on in this video today is the fact that your immune system is based in your digestive system. Not only do we have the stomach acid as like this very strong barrier, then we also have the bile as this very potent cleaner and cleanser of the small intestine. So those two things alone, if you're really looking at it, probably account for like 80% of your immune system in themselves. And they're not even considered a part of your immune system. But the fact is they are. But if we look at the rest of immunity, we have the microbiome. The microbiome is this immense network of different microorganisms that are all working together and collaborating, ideally, in symbiosis with you to give you your ideal health outcomes and to bring it down a level even further every single microbe in your gut has its own gut flora inside each microbe you have a virome where they have hundreds thousands who knows a whole bunch of different viruses that inhabit each microbe so just as microbes are to you in your gut viruses are to bacteria and yeasts and other organisms in your intestines there is an unfathomably deep level of complexity as to what is going on in the microbiome. When you combine that with the fact that the lymphatic system primarily drains into the digestive system, if you look at the lymph nodes, we have massive clusters of lymph nodes around the digestive system. If you go past the first parts of the small intestine, the duodenum and the jejunum, in that latter half of the jejunum and the ileum, the last part, we have a whole bunch of different immune cells. We have these clusters of lymph nodes, we have Peyer's patches, we have basically like this super highway connecting your body's immune system and the lymphatic system, which is sort of like the drainage, the, the sewage system of the body, connects directly to the gut. And again, the fact that 
this is the most bioactive part of your whole body. It's kind of like the sewage system, just like in society, the sewage system goes to a treatment plant. Your gut is literally the treatment plant for the sewage system, the lymphatic system of your body. This is where it goes to all get broken down, to all get worked on. If you look at how sewage treatment plants work, they're actually full of microbes. That's literally how it works. They're fluctuating the pH ranges. There's a bunch of chemical stuff that gets added in, kind of like bile. And there's all these microbes that are doing all of these different jobs and they break all of this matter down. And that's exactly what's happening in your digestive system. So if you're doing all of the physiological things on that first level to support your body, to support your digestive system, and you still have chronic digestive problems, and you really have to look at your immune system. And I would bet if you're saying, yeah, I'm doing all those things and I still haven't got problems, I bet. And leave me a comment. Tell me if I'm wrong, because I doubt I am. I bet you have a compromised immune system. I bet when you get sick, it's more challenging for you to trigger a standard acute immune response like most people, as in triggering a fever, getting sneezes and coughs and producing a lot of mucus. I bet you tend towards a decrease in energy. You develop maybe some liver discomfort, some digestive discomfort. Maybe you have an increase in food sensitivities. And just as your energy goes down, I bet your mood goes down with it. I bet when everyone around you gets sick, you feel depressed, you feel tired, you feel lethargic. Maybe your lymph nodes get all swollen and they stay swollen for months. And the common denominator here is your gut. All of this stuff has to drain into your gut. But this isn't a bad thing. This just means that we need to work on strengthening and rebuilding your immune system. And this isn't something you're gonna do overnight. This is something that takes some time. I can tell you now from personal experience, the most important thing you can do to rebuild your body is to make sure that you have a surplus of calories, of micronutrients, and of rest. Your body needs to make sure that it has all of the resources that it needs to do whatever it wants, and as much time as it could possibly ask for to get all of that work done. If you're at the point where you're strong enough, periodic fasting can also be extremely powerful in helping you to rebuild the immune system, which is gonna consequentially help rebuild your digestive system and improve your digestive function. Now we're gonna move on to the third and final layer. And to go into this layer, we need to start looking at the non-physical aspects of the healing process. When I look back at my healing process, one of my biggest mistakes, my biggest regrets, is that I didn't work on the non-physical aspects to healing for the first two years. And this was basically two years of time wasted where I could have been making leaps and strides. If you're like me and you're dedicated to healing no matter what the cost and you're gonna go wherever healing takes you, if you're not working on the non-physical aspects, then you, you absolutely should be. So the thing about the digestive system is it's where we digest our emotions as well. If you're holding a whole bunch of emotions that you have no idea how to feel, how to experience, how to process and how to let go, you're just gonna build them up in your digestive system and it's not gonna work. And I know what you might be thinking, you know, you might be thinking, wow, what are you talking about? How did you go from such a logical argument to talking about all of these physiological functions like stomach acid and digestive enzymes and, and then we were talking about the functions of the immune system and in fact and now we're talking about energy and emotions where, where did we go where did we make the wrong turn no this is really where it takes you i can tell you that I've, I've done these first two layers you know i'm working on building my immune system up i'm supporting my digestion on the physiological level as much as i'm able and the more i do this work the more it's revealed to me and it just blows my mind every time I experience it. Just how much my, my thoughts and emotions influence my ability to digest the food that I eat. I would say the primary emotions that you would be looking for are the ones that are governed by the root, sacral, and solar plexus chakras. So to give you a non-exhaustive list, but just a, a brief idea of some things to think about, this would be really connected to fear and the right to exist. This would be connected to emotions in general, but also the right to feel and to express yourself. And also shame, rage, and disgust. In my experience personally, but also with that of, of my clients, these are the emotions that generally tend to get stuck in the digestive system. Now it can be any, but these seem to be the most common. And I think it's because these are emotions that tend to be governed by the root, sacral and solar plexus chakras. So if you really want to heal and your gut is just not improving and you've, you've basically done everything I've outlined in the video, but you haven't looked into the non-physical or the emotional things, do it. I really didn't want to. Like I said, it took me two years to really even open myself up to it. But looking back, it's my biggest regret. And like, do you think I want to be here? Do you think I want to be the guy? sitting here talking about gut healing and talking about like emotions and things. Do you think that's who I wanted to be? 
but that's just where this journey took me. This is who I've had to become so that I can attain the healing that I want. And now I have to be here, sitting in front of a camera, telling you that your digestive symptoms could be caused by your feelings and emotions. Now I know for some that's a hard pill to swallow, but there you go, it is what it is. So I hope looking at it through this lens, it gives you a little bit more of an idea as to why working on gut and digestive problems can be so complex because you've got that first layer where many people don't have that information to have. There is physiologically a lot going on, but if we simplify it down into these this five pillar process, if we look at the digestive system through its functions, and we look for the clues that we have dysfunction and correct those dysfunctions, you can feel better very quickly. But then we also have to consider, this is a very bioactive site. There's a lot that's happening digestively, but also non-digestively. This is the seat of your immune system. This is where your lymphatic system leaves the body. This is your sewage treatment plant. This is where most of the toxins are going to be broken down and removed from your body. And this is where a huge amount of your immunity is based. And finally, just as we digest our food, we also have to digest our life experiences. And if there have been things that have happened to you in your life or that have happened around you in your life, you haven't been able to fully make sense of them. You haven't been able to break them down, digest them and absorb them. They're probably stuck in your gut, giving you indigestion. If you haven't considered working on any of that just yet, then I would highly recommend that you do because I achieved some massive results by working on it. And I really just want you to get the outcome at the end. I just want you to achieve the healing that I know is possible for you to achieve. So that's it for today. I hope you've learned something. Let me know what you've learned below. Take care and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.